All right, y'all ready? Yeah. All right, great. Good morning and welcome. I'm John Hickman, one of the chief residents of internal medicine, and it is my pleasure to welcome you once again to the Department of Medicine's Grand Rounds at Washington University School of Medicine. We're so glad you're here. On behalf of our chair, Dr. Frazier, Dr. Costco, Dr. Spencer, and myself, it's a real pleasure to have us back and some people in person and a lot more online watching for what is gonna be a great Grand Rounds. Um, we learned a lot last week about cultivating wellness in our community. And I'm excited for today's talk, building on that with innovative techniques for enhancing support for caregivers in this really difficult time. We have a pair of speakers today. First, Dr. Patrick White. Dr. White completed residency here with us before pursuing a fellowship in palliative care at the University of Pittsburgh. He is currently the inaugural Stokes Family Endowed Chair in Palliative Medicine and Supportive Care, whose research is supported by multiple NIH grants in that discipline. He also leads Evelyn's House, providing support for more than 11,000 patients through end-of-life care. He is joined today by Dr. Deborah Parker Oliver. Dr. Oliver was recruited from University of Missouri last October, where she earned her Master's of Social Work and PhD. She is currently a professor of medicine in palliative medicine. She is a prolific researcher with over 200 publications and has been a PI on five R01 grants. As always, please send questions via the Q&A function as we go, which I will moderate with our speakers later in the talk. And please help me welcome Drs. White and Oliver. Dr. White. Thank you so much. So it is an honor to be here today. Um, Dr. Reeds called me out and said it's going to be tricky to follow the burnout lecture last week. But uh, Dr. Parker Oliver and I are really excited to talk about a topic that hit so many people. Um, so just to show you um, some of the uh, research on this important issue of caregiving for seriously ill um, patients. In the United States in 2020, there are over 50 million caregivers and they compromise nearly 19% of the US population providing unpaid care to an adult with health or functional needs. The percentage has been rapidly increasing. So um, uh, now 24% of caregivers are caring for more than one person. More family caregivers have difficulty uh, coordinating care and an increasing proportion are caring for a loved one with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And the strain on caregivers has never been higher with now 21% of Americans uh, that are providing care reporting their own health is fair to poor. And 23% of those caregivers share that the caregiving needs have taken an impact on their own health and made it worse. So a huge issue that affects so many people. And there are really four caregiving experiences that change my own perspective of caregivers. The first one that hit home was Richard Black and he had metastatic lung cancer and he made me promise to share his name in any presentations we did. He dealt with serious social determinants of health where he had issues with housing and other issues and didn't have the support of a caregiver. He had 97 ER visits and hospitalizations over the last 12 months um, of his life. And it really showed us that without the support of these caregivers, what a huge impact it has. The second Mrs. K was a patient in her mid twenties who suffered from morbid obesity. She weighed over 1500 pounds and had um, extreme challenges with just basic activities of daily life. Just toileting would take her and her mother, you know, over 20 to 30 minutes to perform. And it, it showed me the psychosocial impact that the caregiving experience has on this mom who is one of the most dedicated individuals I've ever worked with. So it took a tremendous toll um, and, and also issues like guilt that caregivers can experience. The third one that really hit home to me was a physician and not a physician at BJC or WashU, but a physician who 
had a care, was the caregiver of a patient with advanced Parkinson's disease. And this healthcare provider we found from our nurses was actually buying stem cells on the black market and putting them in her husband's G-tube. And it just showed me the desperation that even highly trained caregivers, people who know the science and know better can experience and, and the impact that that has. And then the last one, um, who's actually now the CEO of our healthcare system, had, had shared about his brother's experience. And it was one of the big draws that brought me here to Washington University and BJC was hearing him talk about caring for his brother and trying to coordinate all of the support himself and some of the interactions with different providers. And the vision that we would have to make this place special and that we would become a leader on tackling these issues. And that's exactly what I get to share with you today. So we sought out to make addressing caregiver support one of the main tenets of what we would do with our program. And around that time, I went to a national talk by Dr. Parker Oliver. And as I was sitting in awe watching, I, I saw someone who brought the, the scholarship that she's going to share today. She had had R01 grants from three different NIH institutes and really understood designing research that was the highest quality in a field where, frankly, we've had challenges at times. She also understood the clinical implementation. She had been a leader in a hospice program and understood what it took not just to have research in a journal, but to bring it to life to help support our caregivers. And the third piece of it is she'd been on the other side of it. And she's gonna talk a little bit about that today. Um, wrote a book from the heart about what it's like to be a caregiver. And combining all these elements, I knew we could become a national leader in this space. And she works with an amazing team. So we'll get a chance now to, to have Dr. Parker Oliver share a little bit about this work. And then we'll talk a little bit later about some of the practical ways that we now are becoming a, a national leader in the caregiving space. So without further ado, Dr. Parker Oliver. Thank you, and it's great to have faces now uh, to talk to. These are, virtual is great, but it's really hard when, uh, especially if you're gonna share part of your personal story, uh, when you don't have uh, people's faces to look and smile back at you. Um, thank you, um, Dr. White, for a great introduction. Um, I'm excited to be here and share with you what we're doing in palliative care. And I've been at uh, Washington University now for an entire year this week. And so it was great to be able to find my way here and uh, to have some of those things over. And I tell you, the honeymoon's not over yet. We're really excited about what we're doing. I'm excited to share with you uh, my interdisciplinary team of collaborators. Uh, we've been working together now for over 10 years. I've actually been involved in hospice and palliative medicine almost 40 years. Um, I've been director of three hospice agencies before coming back to get my PhD, learning that there was a lot we needed to do uh, to make it better, as great as it, as it was. Uh, my PhD is in rural sociology. My clinical training is in social work. A little known fact is the reason I got really interested in it clear back in my undergraduate work was that my stepfather, um, was connected to a respirator and way back in 1978, we had to make the decision to disconnect that. Luckily, our family had had caring conversations because Karen Quinlan had been going on. And um, so there's an example of how important and valuable those conversations are. Uh, joining me uh, in the lab uh, this uh, last year, uh, Dr. Carla Washington came in January. She's an associate professor and um, actually was one of my PhD students, one of my first PhD students, and um, has now just gotten her first R01, so we're very excited about that. And Dr. Jacqueline Benson is a family scientist who has joined us um, just the past couple of months. And so now together, uh, we look forward to really um, bringing research um, together. 
you know, our mission um, of our lab is that we become a national leader in enhancing support for patients and families with serious illness. We want to be a nationally recognized interprofessional team of scientists that seek to provide and translate evidence-based tools for healthcare providers and their patients and, and family members. Basically, we want to use science to empower patients and caregivers, and that's what our work is all about. So you ask, you know, why caregivers? Um, that's rare that people focus on the family rather than what's going on with patients. Uh, I like to call the caregiver the invisible patient, the second patient. It struck me when I was giving a talk one day at a, a church group, a woman came up and she was in tears after hearing my story. And she said, Debbie, I was invisible. People talked past me, they talked around me, the doctor talked to my husband, didn't hear me, I was invisible. And I think that is just so true. That's exactly how I felt. And I knew the physicians that were caring for my husband. This article appeared in the Huffington Post um, and they titled it, No One Gives a Rat's Ass About Family Caregivers. Kind of a bold statement, but so very true. You know, we have 34 million family caregivers in this country and it's estimated that they saved the United States government $500 billion. Uh, doing jobs that nurses and doctors are trained years to do, and they learn how to do it in the home. They care for bodies that have no resemblance to the people that they married or the parent that birthed them, dress wounds, empty urinals, give injections, administer medications, start IVs, measure bed sores, assess pain, and decide what is an emergency. They brush their patient's teeth and hair. They make sure they take their pills. They become nutritional experts preparing meals that people may or may not eat. They are responsible to keep their loved ones safe and they put their jobs and their lives on hold without complaint. Over the last 40 years, um, the last 20 especially, there actually has become a science affiliated with caregiving. Lots of descriptive research have, has shown some of which Dr. White shared you know, 17% of hospice caregivers in particular report that their caregiving impacted their health. And our work has found that 30% show um, self-defined signs of moderate to severe anxiety and depression. And another 30% report problems sleeping, as you might imagine. And scary enough, 21% feel very alone. Social isolation is a huge problem for family caregivers. 78% do the terrifying thing of administering between five and nine medications, including narcotics. I remember caring for my husband, all pills were white and little. And for those of us that are not trained in pharmaceutical science, we can't pronounce the names. And they would change those medications frequently. And we would fill the pill box when the nurse came out, and then all of a sudden we'd have to take some out. Well, I didn't know which ones were which. I remember my doctor saying to me, who actually was a palliative care doctor, you know, there's little numbers on them that you, and I'm like, are you kidding? I, I can't read those little numbers. So I'd take an ink pen and I'd mark the first initial on each of those pills. I don't know, maybe I killed him with ink, but at least I knew which pills were which. And as physicians, we don't think anything about prescribing or changing those medicines, but for family members, and I wasn't 80 years old, it's a big burden. This quote just really struck my heart. Um, it was from a husband. And when we did an interview with him following the death of his wife, he said, you know, I'm no doctor and I don't know if I killed her or not with the morphine. And people are terrified and they're terrified of it and no training or no understanding of what they're doing. So, I had been studying caregiving for um, about 15 years as a PhD, and I thought for some naive reason that perhaps my um, education would protect me against uh, my own family coming up with the disease, when suddenly, out of nowhere, my 68-year-old uh, husband was diagnosed with nasopharyngeal cancer. 
uh, by a physician, by the way, who stood at the door and looked at the floor and backed away as he gave that diagnosis. I learned firsthand that despite what I knew in my head, what it felt like in my heart. So I've walked in these shoes and I felt invisible and alone. And I've experienced the interactional suffering that comes as we deal with the medical system. My physician friend asked me during this process, you know, if I was going to be able to continue to do this work. And I said, are you kidding me? It is now my passion. We have to do better. We have to make it better. It's not enough just to describe what the problem is. It is time for action and it is time to do something about it. I have with me copies um, of a brand new hot off the press book um, that we have just written, a very small little booklet designed for family caregivers. These are letters and notes that were sent to um, my collaborator at UPenn, Dr. Demiris and I over the past years. And they're letters from the heart of caregivers about their caregiving experience, about their hospice experience and about their experience with research. You know, I have a lot of bench scientists who come to me and they, they can't quite understand what it's like to work with human subjects rather than microscopes. How in the world do you do anything with that? How do you control for things? How do you measure things? And how do you get people to agree to do this at this very difficult time in their, in their uh, life? Um, they are in a crisis stage. Uh, I have to lift up the words of this particular caregiver uh, that we put in, into our booklet. I've never been a caregiver before. You don't know it until you become one, but being a caregiver is really hard. There are so many hardships. Is what I'm feeling normal? I just want to give up, but I have to keep on going. It's my first time, and I have so much to learn. And that feeling of Am I going crazy? I'm surely the only one, is what was the mission behind writing this particular booklet. How do you get people to do research? And why would they do research as they're sitting near the bedside of a dying person? I think this quote answers it really well. You know, answering your questions, we, we clearly administer standardized instruments to get data. Answering the questions forced me to look at what was in my head and actually made it so understandable to other people. When you're feeling something emotional or you're overwhelmed, sometimes it can be very busy in your head. By talking about it, you can make it more understandable and more relatable with other people. It's not enough to describe the problem. It's time to do something about the problem. And that's what our work is all about. We're currently working on five NIH funded clinical trials that test behavioral interventions for caregivers of various different um, hospice and palliative care patients. Funded by the National Institute on Aging, we are working with Alzheimer's caregivers, the National Cancer Institute, we're of course working with caregivers of cancer patients, and those two are actually quite different. And then the National Institute of Nursing Research, which calls itself the End of Life Institute, um, we are able to deal with uh, across the disease trajectory. One of the interesting things about palliative medicine, of course, is that it's all diseases. We're not disease specific. And yet the National Institute of Health are disease specific. So we have to kind of um, specialize and tailor what we do. I want to share two of those trials uh, with you. Um, ACCESS is our oldest trial. We're in our, we have now stopped data collection, actually, and we're getting ready to do analysis. That stands for Access for cancer, Caregivers of Cancer Patients to Education Social Support. It's a seven cluster crossover randomized controlled trial with three groups. One group joins a um, the dirty word today, Facebook uh, private group, um, and is offered uh, educational videos, educational articles, and um, conversations with one another, uh, social support, uh, with a research staff who serves as facilitator. The second group does that, plus also we use Zoom to Zoom them into their plan of care meetings in the hospice team. 
um, normally caregivers are not in hospice team meetings. The hospice team is required by Medicare regulation to meet every two weeks and discuss every patient. Uh, these meetings last for a very long time and they're clearly very expensive to run. Hospice uh, philosophy says that patients and families are a part of decisions and yet they're absent from those very meetings. So we've been able to use Zoom and even telephones uh, to bring them into that meeting. And then of course we have a usual care group for comparisons. So what are our outcomes? Um, I just told you what one of the huge problems, think of it, 30% of caregivers have moderate to severe anxiety or depression. What do we think when we have any disease where 30% of the population has that disease? That's a serious problem. So that's why we have targeted uh, anxiety and depression. We have just concluded enrollment with almost 500 caregivers, um, and we did that in four years. This makes about a database of about 2,000 caregivers for us, um, which is um, also a unique opportunity to do some comparisons across studies. What do the caregivers say about it? Um, about the dreaded uh, Facebook group, uh, it feels like there's somebody there to hear what I've got to say and to give me feedback because this is so difficult for my children. Even though they're grown, I don't feel comfortable talking to them about some of the things that I have felt or that I face. And I can do that with the group. And speaking as a mother who had five grown children during uh, my husband's illness, I understand that so well. You want to stay a mother and sharing those most intimate fears and feelings with your children is very odd and very unusual. So having other caregivers going through it is very, very important. About the team meetings, the team meetings were very informative, especially now that my husband's in the veterans home and he's two hours away from me. So I get up there about once a week. So like I say, I might see something that I addressed and the hospice team, they might see things that I didn't observe. Actually, I'll go to the hospice, um, the nurse in the hospice group first. I love it when they call because they're all there. The chaplain has been very helpful too. He observed something one day that nobody else did and really saved the situation. One of the biggest comments that caregivers have when they go into these team meetings is there's all these people helping me because what they experience is one at a time coming into their homes. And this is the opportunity they see that there is in fact an a whole entire team taking care of them. Our second clinical trial I wanna share a little more about is called Caregiver Speaks. Um, it's an innovative intervention that uses uh, what we call photo elicitation uh, to help caregivers of Alzheimer's patients. And we follow them from active caregiving actually into bereavement, which is another unusual um, opportunity. This is a, just a strict two arm uh, RCT that tests the effectiveness of that intervention. We hope to recruit another 468. We're at uh, 78 today. Again, we measure caregiver anxiety and uh, depression, but also grief intensity. That's why the bereavement is important. And getting a study funded by NIH that addresses bereavement is very hard because bereavement's normal, right? And um, showing complicated grief is, is a very challenging thing. And so this is one of the few interventions for bereavement um, that we've been able to do. And it's one of the few that follows caregivers across the trajectory. Here's an example of what I'm talking about, photo elicitation. We give caregivers prompts and then they go out and they take photos that are symbolic to them around that prompt. So they were asked, what are what things remind you, positive or negative, about your loved one? And the first one is a very positive Im image of these beautiful flowers because his wife had planted these flowers. And so when they come up in the spring, she um, would get great joy out of that. And he also, and remember, you know, Alzheimer's caregiving lasts a long time. And even within hospice, they have a length of stay that's four times that of uh, cancer caregivers, for instance. The other one is not such a positive experience and that those are pictures of bills. It's very real, the financial pain that families have with medicine. Lots has been done around that. But even bigger than that, and of course we had to uh, anonymize this picture, um, is the fact that you get mail with the person's name on it 
after they've died. It's been seven years. I still get mail with David's name on it. And every time I do, it just, your heart just sinks a little bit. And so this is the uh, symbol for um, them of both a positive and a not so positive experience. So where do we go from here? We have had, uh, we're in the, or in the process, um, when we're finished in the next five years, we will have actually seven tested efficacy interventions uh, to share. And what we want to do is create a program project grant, uh, PO1, uh, for those of you who understand the alphabet soup of NIH. That project will be around $10 million, and it takes three interventions and that have some kind of a common theme and some synergy and blends them together around one theme. Uh, we're gonna do this in partnership uh, with the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and one of the great things I've learned at Washington University is there's lots of partnerships with UPenn, so we'll be uh, not alone in that. Just briefly give you an idea of what this is about. It's a toolbox um, that will help caregivers manage Alzheimer's patient pain across the settings, the home, the community, and in the nursing home. One of those projects will be an online um, self-directed problem-solving intervention to teach uh, caregivers about pain management. How do you tell if somebody's in pain when they're demented? Not an easy thing. What do you do about it? How do you, how do you know when to call the doctor? All of those kinds of issues. The other one will be a nurse directed project um, and we're doing some pilot testing on that now. That's an, again, an educational intervention around pain management. And the third one is a nursing home intervention that's based off of a small R21 grant that we had that was very successful. Just because somebody is in the nursing home does not mean that their pain is well or that their care is well uh, cared for. And nothing has shown us more in COVID than the separation and the challenges for families when they are so isolated from their family members during a pandemic, right? So we're going to use what we did in the home, in the nursing home, and bring families in so that they can participate in that discussion. Over the next five years, we intend to be the national leader in interdisciplinary research in palliative medicine. We're going to be the national experts on caregivers specifically. We want to be a sought after uh, postdoctoral placement for all disciplines. Uh, we want to have the PO1 center grant. Um, to my knowledge, there's only one hospice research group that has ever been able to successfully do that before. And we want to hold national research conferences so that we're seen as national leaders. And we're very thrilled to have strong donor support in order to help us make this happen. It's critical as we build our pilot studies and we create tools such as that booklet um, to, to be able to give to caregivers. And finally, we want close integration with the clinical and the educational components in our division. This is the thing that brought me to WashU, quite frankly, is the strong palliative care clinic and um, clinical uh, program that we have so that we actually have assistance in recruiting and we can also help the, the clinical bedside care through um, working with uh, residents and, and palliative care physicians. And then the educational component. I've been teaching in a medical school now for 20 years and I love it and there's nothing better than to have um, young uh, interested students um, and teaching them right from the beginning what palliative medicine is all about. And with that, I'm going to let Dr. White share some additional things that we're doing. Thank you so much, Debbie. So we're really excited now for this part, just to go through some of the really practical ways that we are hoping to become national leaders in caregiver support. As you could hear from Dr. Parker Oliver on the research front, few, if any, institutions can match the momentum we've been fortunate to have over the last several years. Um, and so the first one, and, and, and these are at five different stages that we want to be able to support our caregivers. The first is identifying high-risk patients to begin with, where we can find those caregivers that need the support. So we were really grateful that um, Nathan Moore, Randy Foraker, and the Institute for Informatics, and Stephen Chi and WashU Critical Care 
were able to help us um, uh, with Nathan leading the way, build a machine learning tool that could identify these patients in Epic, scanning hundreds of different variables to find those that are best correlate with 30-day mortality to start with. So this is an algorithm that runs on our patients 24 hours after they're admitted, scans all of these, finds those high-risk patients with an area under the curve of about 0.89. And so we can catch over a quarter of our dying patients with a specificity of around 0.98. And then we review these patients to see who's appropriate to let the primary teams know that they need that support and to have that conversation and to make sure we capture that in the chart. So we send this epic secure chat to these um, attending physicians and say, hey, this patient's at high risk. Would you be willing to have this conversation or would you prefer for the palliative care team to, to have that conversation? Or have you already maybe had the conversation we just haven't documented the right way? And if they opt not to do those things, we try and drill down, why isn't that happening? Where are the gaps? Is it scared uh, that they're gonna have the family upset? Is it that they don't agree with the algorithm? And we've gotten really robust results so far. Um, and this is just the BJH, but at this point, over 500 patients have been enrolled across the system. Attending physicians have done a, just a remarkable job. And I wanna uh, comment on the hospitalists at Wash U, led by Mike Lynn, Devin Odom, Gina LaRosa, that over 95% of them, when we did our last review, had responded to the message. And more than two thirds went and had that difficult conversation with that seriously ill patient. And a, roughly a quarter of the time, palliative care was engaged. But what we were able to do with support from, from our hospitalists, from our amazing resident firm teams and WashU physicians, our cardiology group, our thoracic oncology group, was we took the proportion that came in with those documented goals, which was 6%. And in the preliminary reviews, it's over 60% if they're on TGI. So a tenfold increase and having their goals documented. And, and we submitted, Dr. Moore submitted this grant um, even before COVID started. But it, as the ICU beds became crunched, it was really interesting to note that of those patients identified, nearly a quarter opted to have their goals changed and said, look at, I wouldn't want to be innovated. That's not what's consistent with my goals and values. We're looking at other outcomes too that are, I think are gonna be key to the healthcare system. So what percentage of these patients would end up in the ICU, hospital length of stay, ICU length of stay, inpatient mortality, hospice utilization? But this is not a hospice or a palliative care intervention. This is just good medicine for seriously ill patients. This is identifying them so Dr. Parker Oliver can bring that support to them much earlier in their disease trajectory. <clears throat> Our partners with Siteman and, and other groups have been really supportive and interested in how do we bring that support to caregivers much earlier upstream. And like I said, we, we are already live at Missouri Baptist, Barnes Jewish, Alton Hospital, uh, Barnes Jewish St. Peter's and Progress West and uh, Memorial Hospital now. The other component of this to supporting caregivers that we're equally, if not more excited about, is bringing it into the outpatient clinics. And, and we've been really fortunate with our partners with the BJC Medical Group and the faculty practice plan um, that we're working to get advanced care planning much earlier upstream, a similar algorithm to identify these patients, bring that support to them, change the structure to reward our providers for having those discussions. And all of this just has happened within the last 24 months that we've been able to move this forward. So we are really excited that few healthcare systems have integrated this as well. So for our clinicians that are on the call, um, we now have the capability in my chart that, the, the, that patients and caregivers and families can start this conversation themselves. 
we have some amazing tools um, they called Prepare for Your Care, now built into my chart. We're working with researchers at UCSF um, that allow families to go through on their own and start having these conversations and asking some of the difficult questions we need to that have been well validated in, in all different groups and, and found to be highly effective. So we're really proud. We're grateful for our IT partners, Michelle Thomas and Jeff Sislow and others that, that actually made this all possible too. The third piece for enhancing support for caregivers is we knew we needed to increase access to palliative care. And it has been a tremendous effort from a lot of different people that I get to share today that we went from having roughly 11 providers across the system three years ago to 22 providers by the end of this year. Um, that's remarkable growth. And um, it's gonna allow our caregivers to get support earlier. Um, and we also respect that all, all groups across our system have made this a much bigger focus themselves. And they do such a great job too with having these difficult conversations. But we wanna be there for additional support when we can be most helpful. And a piece of that, maybe the one good thing to come out of the poly, you know, to come out of the pandemic um, would be palliative telehealth and virtual care. Because it is really tough for sick patients and families to add one more visit, come into the city and, and see another doctor. You know, the average patient is seeing 10 different providers in the last six months of life in Missouri. And what we found is by doing virtual care and having those visits in the home, that we've been able to cut the no-show rate from 50% all the way down to 15%. And we've seen that telehealth can be a tool. We've used it on the floors and the ICUs, even did a little pilot in the emergency department. We think that's gonna be a terrific way to bring this support to more of our seriously ill patients and caregivers. And we're working to build a system-wide effort um, between WashU and BJC that can really address this. And we're pleased that we've got some big announcements coming on that front. But I just wanna show you some of the great work. This is Dr. Elise Everett and our clinic here at BJH and others, but, um, you can see the clinic visits went from virtually none to a five-fold increase over the last year. And I'm going to show the impact of that because I think it's really important. And we're adding another provider in a couple of weeks just focused on the outpatient as well. And, and because of the great leadership of, of our hospitalists and firm teams, um, we've seen the number of complex advanced care planning nodes increase from 400 to over 1100 in one year. So rapid increase in how we're utilizing these tools. We completely redid the way we capture that to make it more provider friendly. And the beauty is now it's easily recognizable that you can see where the provider before had that conversation automatically in the same tab for the first time. So just to show you the impact, Dr. Everett audited the first 50 patients that she saw and what she found is that 78% of these seriously ill patients were able to die at home. 90% had hospice support. These are much, much higher than the national average. And one of the most challenging groups across the country that Dr. Everett's an expert in is ALS. And ALS patients have an incredible symptom burden. Nationwide, they tend to die often in hospitals and only 30 to 50% of them nationally have hospice support. Through this clinic, 98% of patients were able, either able to die at home or with hospice support. That is a huge impact on their, their experience of uh, being with their loved ones. And you can just think in particular during the pandemic, what that meant to everybody. The next area that we've been able to target is where we've just completed a contract with the Palliative Care Quality Collaborative. And what that's gonna allow us to do is in our electronic medical record, to do a better job of defining core symptoms like pain, nausea, anxiety, 
and recording the impact our palliative care providers have on that and then benchmarking to national standards. Because as Dr. Parker Oliver shared, not treating or managing those symptoms to their fullest takes a tremendous toll on our caregivers. So we're really excited to be one of the national leaders in, in incorporating this with our partners at Duke, UCSF, and, and other institutions. <clears throat> and not only are we doing that, but we are building some of the tools. The brilliant Dr. Carla Washington um, that Debbie was just sharing about is building a dashboard that not only allows us to recognize the symptom burden for patients, but to capture it for caregivers too. So this is going to be something that um, very few institutions are doing, if any right now, that's very innovative and that we can scroll through large numbers of patients like we do. Initially, this will be used in the hospice setting where we often review 50 to 100 patients in a three hour meeting and really flag those that need symptom um, and psychosocial support much earlier on in the course. And the last one we've had for a few years now, but I just want to highlight that for caregivers that are dealing with the, the worst symptoms, the terminal agitation, and we've been very blessed that our hospice is able to keep roughly 95% of patients in their home. But for that 5% in the hospital that are you know, suffering the worst agitation or pain crises or trouble breathing, it is really comforting for caregivers to know that we have one of the best inpatient hospice houses in the country. And the feedback I get, um, and, and I, I had the tremendous joy of opening it, um, is that it feels like patients will cry when they come through the door expecting to be in a healthcare facility. And they say, this feels like a house. And that's how I was treated by every staff member, like my own family. It, it is just powerful. And um, while I could read comments all day, I think it's really powerful to see the hard outcomes. So just to give you a frame of reference, nationwide, only 40% of patients who die in the ICUs have their caregiver rate that experience at the highest level. At Evelyn's house, 97% over the last three years have rated that experience at the highest level. That's outstanding. That is a huge impact on how the great care they received all the way along is remembered and, and giving them that tremendous support at the end. And like I said, we've been really great about being able to get the support in the homes for, for the, the vast, vast majority of patients. But having that extra resource for those that need it most, and not just for our healthcare system, but we take care of the trickiest ones from around the state. Um, and we're really proud of those outcomes. So getting these tools earlier to our patients and their caregivers is gonna be absolutely critical. You know, the, the place that has done this the best um, and I will be blown away if anyone can throw in, John, if anyone knows this place, this location where they have mastered caregiver support. If anyone throws it in the chat, you will be loved for forever, where they, they are getting goals of care conversations on virtually everyone. Do I have any takers? Or anybody from the audience? We'll give them a moment and see. All right, all right. We're going to give, uh, give them a moment. just yet. Denmark question mark? All right, that's a good good guess. Okay. They do do a better job there. It is Wisconsin. none other than La Crosse, Wisconsin, hey, we did where 97% of patients who die had their wishes recorded. Um, Gunderson Healthcare System, they made a real targeted focus. And we feel like St. Louis has similar potential in a lot of ways to be one of the places that is the national leader in this. And if you have your wishes recorded, you are 37% less likely to die in an intensive care unit. They were voted Forbes Magazine's best place to die in America. 
So if we could have that similar type of accolade, we are gunning for it and become one of the true transformational leaders um, in supporting caregivers, having these goals of care discussions and helping our patients and families to be supported and supported at home using the amazing technology that Dr. Parker Oliver, Dr. Washington and Dr. Benson are bringing to the field. Thank you so much for being with us. And we've got a few minutes if there are any questions that Dr. Oliver and I can answer. Thank you. Thank you both so, so much for uh, speaking with us on this really important topic. We have a number of questions in the chat. I'm free to open it up if you want to ask anything first. All right, we'll, we'll get started. Uh, the first one actually just that came in pretty early was where can we find collective voices? Ah, <laughs> well, it just got printed <laughs> on Tuesday. Um, so contacting me would be the best way at this point. We're going to give it to uh, hospice social workers um, through our generous donors. We're able to give copies away and uh, we'll be doing that um, across the country in various different hospice agencies. But get a hold of me and I'll be happy to share it. Wonderful, thank you. Um, we have a question here that says, what training programs have been offered to physicians, nurses, or other interdisciplinary team members to assist with learning how to be a better supporter for caregivers? Oh, absolutely. So the first part of this that we want to get better about is having that conversation with a patient or family that is serious illness. So we built something within our institution between Washington University and BJC called Communication Skills Academy. And that is where we're gonna teach them both having the conversation as well as all of the resources available to them. And the way we do it is with trained actors called standardized patients that are trained to get upset if the emotions aren't being properly supported. And, I, and so um, that is going live. The first groups are set up in November and December um, starting with um, Barnes St. Peter's and Progress West are the first two hospitalist groups that are undergoing that training. Great question. Another here from Dr. Reeds, uh, he comments this is incredibly innovative work and says, are there predictors of who is most amenable to discussions of goals of care? And similarly, are there predictors of who is most adept at facilitating productive discussions of patients at the end of life? And by most adept, he says they do not mean who can change code status the most, but who leaves the patient and family with a sense of sensitive and timely discussions of goals. What we find is, um, ironically, the most interested in these discussions are actually the people that are the most anxious and depressed, and those actually are the younger people. We find that anxiety and depression is higher in caregivers that are younger and of cancer patients specifically. I think that's partly because it happens so quickly. Um, so you would kind of think maybe older people would be more adept to and interested, but that is not what we've not what we've been finding. Um, as far as a physician I'll let you know. Well and, and the other thing I will say on that, the group that we feel like that we've struggled and we want to do a better job of supporting especially in St. Louis, our underserved communities, and, and particularly the Black community. Um, and we want to be one of the groups that's really got to focus on, on making these tools and resources available for everybody and engaging groups that historically we haven't done as strong a job with. So, so that's where the research, I think, shows probably our, our most tremendous gap. The best by far is if they have an ICU nurse in the family. <laughs> that makes the conversation, uh, yeah. We all can't be quite so lucky. Um, <laughs> and building right on top of that, you already partly answered this, that we live in a very multicultural city, as you know. Can you comment on some of the differences more in the views of palliative care and hospice among different cultural groups? Studies have documented, as I'm sure you would know, lower rates of palliative care hospice utilization among Black Americans. And are there other steps that we can take to improve that trust around end of life care discussions and more utilization in those communities? There's a problem that we still are seeking an answer to about access for minorities into hospice. It is a huge issue. Part of the issue is of course, this tied into workforce in that we also don't have a big diverse workforce in the hospice setting. 
making it really hard. And family support systems are very different um, in minority um, families. They're very committed to keeping re people at home and yet very hesitant to accept the very resources that will help them do it. Uh, lots of research trying to understand why, but no magical answers uh, on the hospice side have happened yet. So, and I'll just tack on, I want to say that our group, um, our colleagues at Christian Hospital Northeast, I think have done some really amazing work around this, going out into the community, um, being on a radio show and hosting that and addressing a lot of these really challenging questions. We actually are working right now on a PBS documentary, and, and there's some issues that are going to get pulled into there. Um, so there's a lot of work that's going into it. But I think nationally, no one's really found the silver bullet for the best way to engage. And, and you're absolutely right. That's a great point that, that the outcomes in terms of hospice um, are not evenly distributed across groups. Kind of building on that, um, you, you mentioned maybe there are some patients for whatever cultural reasons prefer not to die at home. Uh, one of our residents here comments they've experienced that personally here. H how are you working with these patients at end of life? I will add to that, how can we as providers who are having our patients die in the hospital or preferring to do so, how can we support caregivers in that instance? Yeah, so um, that is exactly, John, where Evelyn's house we feel is so special. We really do not want patients dying in the hospital. It is not set up well. Um, with visitor support and, and the type of, um, you know, at Evelyn's house, we have music therapists, expressive therapists, a lot of individuals designed not just to support the patient, but really the whole family too. So we would, we would say that's a tremendous resource for the healthcare system to, to help to get patients, especially those with a heavy symptom burden that are in the hospital, out of the hospital. In hospice care, we also do something called a respite stay for patients that aren't having symptoms where they can have a five-day stay. And sometimes families will do that as patients are transitioning to end of life. And then as those symptoms come, they'll stay in that area that they're going for the respite stay, whether at Evelyn's house or a different facility. And, you know, the alternative to that is often nursing homes. And um, the research on end-of-life care in nursing homes is beyond belief. Um, it, it is filled with problems. And I've done numerous studies in long-term care facilities trying to improve that. That's part of why we're trying to make that a, a part of the PO1. So that's where we're really blessed to try to have alternatives, um, something besides. Not everybody can do it at home because of the burden. It is huge. And not everybody has a caregiver and not everybody has the resources to make that happen. So this country needs to, to figure that out. And Evelyn's house is possible because of strong donors. Not every community has that uh, either. Uh, a question just came in specifically to Evelyn's house. Uh, how many patients can you accommodate yeah. there? What are the average waiting times like to be admitted? No, it's fantastic. We have 16 beds there and we're actually, you know, looking at ways that if it needs to expand, evaluating that potential. Um, and, and it's a huge support. Patients often will get their symptoms managed, return home, um, or patients often come from the ICUs where we know time is going to be limited. And they are really grateful um, for that level of support. So, um, so we actually most days do not even run a waiting list for Evelyn's house. The majority of time, you know, if your loved one has a heavy symptom burden, we can get them in there right away for those patients that have symptoms. If they don't have symptoms, then it's trickier because we try and reserve those beds for the patients who need that huge amount of support the most. Um, I also want to call out there's some community partners we work with. Um, Oasis started by St. Louis's own Marilyn Mann that does an amazing job supporting caregivers. Um, they've been a huge asset, um, you know, helping it along the trajectory. Um, we've been really fortunate too that all different groups have come in to push for this cause. I wanna call out Dr. Ira Codner, who's done a lot of great work building support. Um, um, Dick Miles, there, there are a lot of people who we're just so grateful for 
um, that have, have done this. Um, Andy Newman, um, the Stokes family that have really all come together and seen the value of making this happen. I know we're out of time for today. Is there, is there one last question or should we just, we can absolutely throw one more. We got a bunch more, but yeah, we can do one more here. Let me just say, um, I can tie these together. If, um, if you could comment on how we as physicians might acknowledge and check in with the caregiver, and if there are any sort of methods or technologies that we as physicians in particular can facilitate these goals of care discussions at end of life, particularly as you mentioned, 72% of our hospitalists were taking that burden on themselves. So here are some very simple lines that you can use, um, scripts, so to speak. And you turn and you look at a caregiver and you say, how do you think they are doing? And do you think this plan will work? And most importantly, you know, I understand this must be so hard for you on so many levels. Those three things are never said and are never heard. And that's what they long to hear to validate their experience and to be heard because they have a different perspective than the patient who wants to be a good patient and doesn't complain. And you can't always believe what the patient is saying. My husband would go in and he was best friends with his physician and the doctor would say, how are you? And he goes, I'm great. And I'm like, really? You were puking your guts out last night. Um, so just ask and then validate and acknowledge how hard it is and that they're doing a good job. That'll make a big difference. Wonderful, thank you so much for that. Thank you so much for all of your talk today and all the work you do, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks again for being here. For those listening at home, I will add the QR code here in just a moment.